as we uh, as we get started now, everyone, um, if you want to ask questions, I'll ask you to put them in the chat, and we'll use that for questions. You can chat them direct to me um, at Rabbi Dan Moskovitz, and then I you don't have to have everybody seeing your question, um, and I will try to relay them. And if I can't relay it, or if we're able to do it, depending on how many people we have on the call, I might just ask you to turn on your mic and your camera and ask the question yourself. Um, so, but for now, I'm going to mute everyone except for our uh, panel, um, and I want to make sure that. Salam alaikum, Aziz. Alaikum assalam. Hello. You know, my mother's name is Sarat. Also, you know. Mark, I'm going to mute the you. the best name. <laughs> Aziz, if you can just unmute. Oh, here we go. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, both Sarah and I agree that Sarah is the best name. We both share, uh, we both share the perfect name. Yes. So um, thank you guys for making time for this conversation. Uh, I've known Sarah for a long time, and Aziz, I've gotten to know you only a little bit now through Sarah, but I had the opportunity to watch your TED Talk and to read on your website about all the, the work that you're doing. And uh, it seems incredible. I, I'm so thrilled to get to know you in this regard. Uh, this conversation Thank is you. probably long. You're welcome. This conversation is probably long overdue. And it's terrible in many respects that we're doing it only in the shadow of crisis. But you know, sometimes crisis is an opportunity. And so a conversation that should have happened a while ago, at least we're having it now. And, and hopefully it'll be the beginning and not just a, a one-off. Um, so I guess I'm trying to understand for myself and I think our community is trying to understand, what is it like life on the ground away from the headlines for, for Jews and Palestinians living together in Israel today? And I know you guys are, I think both are in Jerusalem primarily um, and different cities will have different lived experiences. Um, but could you speak generally to what life is like for Jews and Israelis living in uh, Jews and Palestinians living in Israel today. Let's start there. Aziz, you want to begin? <laughs> no, I'll always let Sarah begin. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be the the gentleman I'm trying to be. <laughs> so, Sarah, do you wanna do you wanna start? Well, I was I was about to ask you if you wanted to start, so we we can do this for a while. But sure, uh, happy to. Rabbi, thank you so much for inviting me, and it's uh, it's an honor to be here with Aziz and with uh, with all of you. And some of you I, I I know from life online, and it's a thrill. So thank you. Um, and interestingly enough, um, I'll admit I'm actually in Los Angeles right now, so I'm I'm on the I'm in Pacific time. I'm visiting my family for the first time since COVID-19. And uh, my Aunt Karen wants to, me to show everyone her painting. So there you go. But uh, normally I am in Jerusalem. And what's life like there? It's, um, oh, it's, it's complicated is what it is. There is this poignancy in it. There's beauty in it. But describing it in a few sentences, it, it's really hard. A long time ago, I had a friend who asked me, he was blind, he was blind from the day he was born, and he asked me to describe a sunrise over the Dead Sea that I had seen. And uh, I didn't know how to do that without you know, using description of color and shape, which he had, no, he had no reference point for that. So I did my best to bring that sunrise alive for him by describing the way the wind feels when the sun begins to come up and how the temperature changes from this brittle, sharp, cold against your skin to, to warmth. And so I'm going to try to do that with what's life like in Jerusalem from my perspective as a Jewish Israeli by telling you about some of those things, the sound and the texture and personal experience, but it's hard to give a big picture because each experience is so unique and uh, and words sometimes just don't do it justice, but it's it's nuanced, um, and there's tension in the air. And uh, I'll tell you one story. A few um, a few weeks ago, as the as uh, conflict began to escalate between Israel and Gaza, and as um, 
as folks living within the, the, the borders of 1948 Israel began to um, get angry at one another and there, there was rioting, and a lot of violence. Um, my apartment where I live over on the sort of the southeast corner of Jerusalem got hit with Molotov cocktails. Now, the thing about our building is we're actually a very, we're a unique building in a really special sense of the word. Jerusalem, which we talk about being, you know, the united between East and West, and it's, it's a melting pot and lots of different people is actually extraordinarily separate. People may live next to each other, but they don't really live with each other. You can go to a restaurant and you'll see um, Palestinian, uh, Palestinians sitting at one table and, and Jews at another table, but seldom at the same table. So our building is actually different. We're not, um, we're, we're all living together, literally one on top of the other. Um, I'm, I'm Jewish, my, um, my partner is um, an East Jerusalemite Christian Palestinian. Our landlord is um, from Nazareth, he's Christian. There's um, Palestinians living floor above us. There's religious Jews living below us. There are um, immigrants from Ethiopia, the immigrants from the former Soviet Union living next to us. We're all, in, we're all together. And it's something that I really like. But then a few weeks ago, our house got hit with a Molotov cocktail and we saw the fire. And I went running down to try to pour it out with a bottle of water and, and one of our, the, the neighbor from the former Soviet Union went down with a bucket to pour it out. It turns out that one of the, um, the, the Christian Palestinian guys living you know, on a floor above is a volunteer for the Israeli police. So he went running out to go look for the guy who had thrown the Molotov cocktail. And there was, uh, it was one of these things where we realized that the, the fragile and poignant beauty of this building where we live was really in danger. And so we've made an extra effort since then to look out for one another, to try to see one, one another, to get to know one another on a, on a deeper level, take care of one another and try to be the change that we actually wanna see in Jerusalem where you have folks living as equals, sharing space, caring for each other and um, not just as neighbors in separate units, but really as neighbors sharing the space and going, being able to go between the units and, and creating um, a, a better society. Wow, Sarah, I have so many questions I would like to ask just about your building as a microcosm of things. I, I'm gonna turn to Aziz though, and Aziz, what's, what's the reality like today from your perspective? You know, the same question between Jews and Palestinians. Uh, you know, that's... The sad thing of what Sarah said is I actually had the exact same experience. I've lived before in also a joint building in French Hill, and also my building was uh, was hit by a Molotov cocktail uh, at some point, and a car outside the building was uh, was uh, was burned um, as a result of it, and it was a joint building. It was one of those like probably there are a handful of those buildings in in Jerusalem. And it's kind of crazy. We we both have gone through uh, the same experience. Um, what are Palestinians and Israelis feeling like in Jerusalem now? I think first thing I want to say is I think the moment things escalate, unfortunately, we quickly too many of us resort into our national religious identities very quickly, and so it doesn't matter what's happening. We very quickly become well. This is affecting me, this is affecting my people, and therefore I'll suspend all other things and, and focus on those identities. Uh, and, and that's normal in some ways. Uh, if, if any identity is a threat, that's an identity that becomes your stronger identity in that moment. I think that's part of what's happening now in Jerusalem. You can see stronger divisions among people. But you also can see a few people who are pushing together, coming together and working, not just coming together, working together and trying to affect change. And, and by saying working together, it's not just that they meeting and you know sharing a meal just together, but actually trying to figure out, deal with the roots of, of our problems, the conflict. Uh, uh, to me, it's most powerful. I was in Jerusalem, I'm, I'm in the States now, but I was in Jerusalem a month ago. And to me, it's most powerful when you see Israelis and Palestinians protesting together. 
that's one of my favorite scenes. And I, I always feel frustrated that not more people do it, but it's still one of the most hopeful moments for me to go to Sheikh Jarrah, the neighborhood in Jerusalem that was probably the reason for the last escalation with the displacement uh, threat of the people who live there. And last time, uh, one of the last days I was in Jerusalem, I was there and I was standing on my right was a member of Knesset, Israeli member of Knesset, Mosi Raz, and on my left was a Palestinian guy from you know, Mount of Olives. And to be able to stand together and not look at issues as Israeli-Palestinian, but actually try to deal with issues based on justice, based on what's right and what's wrong, regardless. Um, I think that's too often missing. And the day-to-day -day stuff becomes scary. Uh, I, I can tell you my brother, for example, almost for three weeks has not let his young son, who's 15 years old, out of the house because he's terrified. Um, I would argue most Palestinians are horrified from police. Uh, you know, and it's when we talk about narratives, and that's most of my work, is the, the idea of having multiple narratives. So when I talk to my Israeli friends, I often talk about the police as protector, as one of us, as you know, somebody who helps us. To most Palestinians in Jerusalem, the sight of police officer is terrifying. It means I'm in danger. I don't know what he's going to do, what's going to happen to me. Uh, it becomes a sign of oppression. And that feeling is so in the air in Jerusalem. You can feel it in every place you can go, especially in the eastern side of Jerusalem. And it's one of the hardest things, I think, to deal with right now is, is how do you make everyone feel included? How do you build a society that's not divided? How do you um, bring people together when everything divides you? So I grew up not, I grew up in Jerusalem. I didn't have any Jewish Israeli friends or at all, they didn't know any Jewish Israelis until I was 18 years old. And I went through getting to know people. I would argue many, many Palestinians and Israelis, unfortunately, don't go through the process I went through. And that's, that's a big part of why we go into the direction we are going. Sarah, you were you were nodding along a lot as Aziz was talking about the how the police and and the different perspectives of it. And obviously, we we can't hear that and not think about you're both in the states, and we talk a lot here in Canada as well about the relationship between the police and marginalized communities. That certainly had an echoing effect. Um, so I'm curious why you were nodding along and what your experience with that was. And the the other question I want to ask. So these uh, Israelis and Palestinians that protest together. Are they um, supported in doing that by their by their own communities? Are they vilified for it? I mean, I had the experience of working on a, a letter with one of the leaders of the Muslim community here that we wrote for the Globe and Mail, and you know, the the response from our respective communities, ours was largely positive, but the response from his community was not that they you know they shouldn't be out there working together. So I guess it's two questions. I'm curious about this police thing, and then the other about uh, you know Jews and, and, and Palestinians protesting together, how those are received from their respective positions. Sarah, you wanna go first? Sarah, you're muted. Okay, yeah, sorry, there was a, I was trying to unmute and you, man, you did it for me, thank you. Okay, well, I think said something that really resonated at the beginning, which is during these periods of tension, we do tend to go to our to our own tribes. And there is a real sense of um, kind of wanting to sort of circle the wagons and 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 protect your protect yourself. And it, it's an understandable feeling. You know, we want to feel safe. We want our kids to be safe. We want the people that we love, our family and our closest friends to be safe. But if we indulge in that too much, then we forget to think about looking beyond that and um, and realizing that we don't have to be so uh, tribal in a sense. But it's really hard to do that. And, and Aziz is right that during this period, we have certainly retreated to our corners. And I think this is true in, in all the communities involved. And, and it's hard to, to get beyond that. It's hard because to answer your, your first question about pressure from communities, it's it's hard because of pressure from communities, and it's also hard for our own for our own reasons. Some of them aren't rational, 
and some of them aren't logical and some of them are so deeply ingrained in our own narratives, um, as Aziz mentioned. And then now getting to the issue of the police, I see that playing out a lot. You know, as a Jewish Israeli woman, when I see the police, more or less I feel like they're there to protect me, but I know that um, my Palestinian friends don't feel that way. And what's also interesting is there are, um, is there are people who are mostly in the Christian community in Jerusalem who actually feel torn between both worlds. They don't feel accepted by Jewish Israel, and yet they also don't feel accepted by, um, by the Muslim Palestinian community. And their way of dealing with this, and, and these are several people I know, at least somewhere between 10 and 20, have actually joined the police force. And yet they're also terrified of being discovered for being in the police. And so they're straddling this world of trying to find belonging and, and, um, um, and, and also, you know, for, what other, for whatever other reasons that they have for getting involved. But um, one guy I know was accused of working for the police by his community members on Mount of Olives. Um, and even though he doesn't work for the police, they attacked him, they nearly killed him. So there's a lot of tension there. And I also see it too, when I'm, when I'm walking with, with um, I was with a girlfriend of mine and we were walking just on Jaffa Road and the police came up to us, she's Palestinian, and asked for her ID. But they didn't ask for my ID. So I handed them my ID anyway and said, no, we don't want your ID. And I said, well, if you're going to ask for her ID, you better ask for mine as well. They looked at me like I was out of my mind, but they, um, and I, sorry, there's a, there's a garbage truck outside the, the house. Uh, sorry for the background noise. So I've seen that firsthand and I know that um, I'm privileged in that way to feel safe with the police and I know that many others don't. And that's something that um, I'm really glad Aziz brought up. And that's why I was nodding. Yep. Aziz, anything you wanna add? Yeah, I mean, I think when, when we push to a place where it's us or them and us versus them, then your community doesn't like it when you do stuff together because it challenges the concept that they all evil and we are all good and vice versa. So people who do this are often accused of, I don't know, on the Palestinian side of normalization, which means normalizing the occupation, accepting the occupation, which is to me like ridiculous when somebody is coming to protest against the occupation, you accuse it of normalizing. It, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, and then on the Israeli side, the same thing. I mean, I, I remember going I used to run an organization called Bereaved Families Forum, which brought Israelis and Palestinians who lost family members in the conflict together. My brother was killed, and uh, when when uh, when he was uh, 19 years old, I was I was 10, and I remember going to some schools, and we would talk. I would go with an Israeli to school, an Israeli who lost a family member, and I. I often went with this guy named Ramil Hanan, whose daughter was killed by a Palestinian suicide bomber. And it was interesting when we walked to a Palestinian school, the Palestinian kids wanted mostly to talk to him, not to me. But when they wanted to attack, they attacked me. It's like, why are you with him? You give him legitimacy. And then when we walked, and, and they'll say horrible things. And then when we walk to an Israeli school, it's the same thing. They'll want to talk to me to know more things. But the ones who wanted to attack, they would attack him and say, you are betraying your daughter. You are betraying your, uh, your family by speaking with the... Uh, with a Palestinian, giving him legitimacy, bringing him into this classroom. And so there is this attack. And that, that's, I think, why it's important for us still to work together, because think about it. Majority of those kids I've met, whether in Palestinian school or Israeli school, have never met either a Palestinian before or an uh, Israeli before. And when people, and I try to bring it a lot especially to, to Palestinian communities, when Israelis come to Sheikh Jarrah and say, we are standing here with those Palestinian families, it sometimes it shocks a lot of Palestinians because that's the first time they hear of an Israeli Jew who's coming standing with them in solidarity. And not just standing in solidarity, they might get beat up by the police just like we are getting beat up by the police. And that really changes how people think. It, it makes them ask questions. It makes them say, so, okay, it's not really us as Palestinians versus them as Jews. 
I like to more look at it as us, those who want to believe and work for justice, for peace, for co for shared society, and those who are not there yet. And our job is to try to bring more of those people in. And I would argue it also really pisses off the police because when these protests happen, you get quite a few getting arrested. I think two weeks ago, a few organizations uh, set up a protest, a big protest together in the West Bank, Israelis and Palestinians in in Bejala together. And I know eight activists, half Israelis, half Palestinians who were arrested in that, uh, in that protest. Because it, this image of us together, it challenging this whole concept of who's who, scares politicians, scares establishment, and they, they don't like to see it. And in most, by the way, for Palestinians from the West Bank, Israeli Jews in Israel, there are a handful of places where you can legally meet. So it's really difficult to bring those meetings even to happen. Uh, you are muted. Uh... Sorry. Oh, Sarah, you're still muted? Uh, OK. Does that work? Right. Oops. No, I just okay, I wanted okay. to, I, I Go ahead. to add something to, to what Aziz said. I was, um, I think he's so right when he talks about the way that uh, the, the people look at these kinds of, of gatherings where people are in solidarity together. A few months ago, I went with Rabbis for Human Rights to a village near Nablus, where we were going to go plant olive trees. And too often these olive trees then get uprooted by the settlers who live very close by. And so then we have to come back and plant them. And so we went, there were probably 200 of us. It was this gorgeous day at the beginning of spring. And it was um, just as COVID started lifting in Israel, there's a real sense of optimism and all these different rabbis and um, people involved in rabbis for human rights and um, mostly Jewish Israelis were part of our little contingency. We walked up the hill, each schlepping this, these giant olive trees, my bag broke. And so I had branches everywhere. It was, it was an adventure. And then um, Palestinians from the village came to help us plant. And so we're working side by side and they, they brought out, uh, there was a, a priest from Scotland who came and gave an address and then and two rabbis gave an address, including a, a really special guy named Rabbi um, Elhanan Miller who can speak Arabic. And so he gave the, he then translated the address into Arabic. And then the member of the community came and spoke, it was great. And then for some reason, the soldiers who were very nearby had gotten orders to clear the area and they started firing stun grenades at us. And we you know, were looking at each other, you know, the Jews and Palestinians together on this hill and, and the Scottish priest, you know, scared, startled. We're trying to get down the hill as the, the troops move in on us. And then um, one of the soldiers tries to you know, move us along more quickly. And several of us tried speaking with them. We asked them, why are you doing this? And we, will, we were given orders to do so. I said, but don't you see, we're, we're just trying to plant trees. And another person said, but we're, we're here, you know, we're here in a peaceful way. You have no reason to do that. And I could see a few of the soldiers had these looks that crossed their face. And I felt like they were wrestling with the orders that they had been given and with this decision to carry out those orders. And they said, we're sorry, but we have to do this. It's for your own safety as well. And, and we all went down the mountainside. But, and then as we were leaving, Several of us tried to um, you know, speak with the soldiers on our way out through the area. We wish them Shabbat Shalom. And we tried to be as pleasant as possible as really, in, in, a, in a sense, trying to show them what this change can look like and that it, it isn't scary for people to work together and that it's actually something special and, and maybe they can begin to question their own assumptions about what their own, what they're doing, what they've been asked to carry out. I, I want to remind, thank you, Sarah. I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, you can put them into the chat. Um, you both, before we started inviting people onto the screen, we were talking a little bit about the school system and Aziz mentioned going to schools. Um, it, it seems, to, it appears to me that people living so close in proximity to each other are such strangers to each other and even children, as we talk about Palestinian schools and Israeli schools, don't they, they don't play together, they don't learn together, they don't you know experience life together. So that these problems are, are systemic and they're deeply rooted generationally now in society. Um, is there any movement to beyond you know 
the fringe leftist groups that are, you know, kumbaya and stuff like that. Is there any structural movement to try to address the, the roots of this by getting younger generations to, together and to have uh, relationships and, and connection with each other? Not on an institutional level, to my to my knowledge, at least. Uh, maybe Sarah knows more. I know some organizations trying to show that it's possible. So uh, there's a an organization called Hand in Hand that has multiple schools in Israel that is mixed. Palestinian, Israeli Jews together. And we, when I say here Palestinian, I mean those who have Israeli citizenship, not from the West Bank, um, that they study together. There's one in Jerusalem, there's one in Wadi Ara, there's a few of those. Uh, and that's the largest institutional thing where you can see it happening. There are a few organizations that challenge it by going to schools and talking to students there. Uh, so Combatants for Peace, uh, Parent Circle Bereaved Families Forum, few others are doing it uh, who will go and try to introduce these students even if it's once or twice a year just to give them uh, an opportunity to have this conversation because just like you mentioned i think vast majority and not only palestinians in the west bank that is even more understandable but we're talking about israeli citizens i would go beyond and say the same thing even exists and this is probably one of um the worst things about the educational system in Israel, the same thing exists within the Jewish community. The religious, you have religious Zionist schools, you have ultra-Orthodox in use and you have uh, uh, schools and you have secular ones. And those kids don't always mix. So you end up already growing up in this segregated society where Arab schools within Israeli system have Arabic teachers and then religious ones have religious teachers. And I think that already fracture a society from the beginning and you don't have much sympathy you don't have much connection and yeah you'll meet eventually that you'll if you're an israeli Jew, you'll meet palestinians for the first time really arabs for the first time when you are or religious or whatever when you go to university which is already after the army or sometimes when you are in the army which which is not great as well and then you go to university that's when you're going to meet people who are citizens like you from the village literally across the street uh, and that's already you 20 some years old so you already set we, we we get engraved in our own stereotypes of growing up and it takes a lot of work to undo the stereotypes we grew up with and if we wait until that late it's going to be a lot harder and that explains by the way why I, I believe it's true across the country younger people are more likely to be right-wing than older people in, in Israel, which is not the same in most places in the world. It's often you grow up left-wing and you become more right-wing as you grow up. In Israel, it's you grow up right-wing and you become more left-wing as time passes. Sarah, did you want to add to that? Oh, and I love what Aziz said. I agree with him. And I think though, one of the challenges we face in the land is that our government has very little incentive to actually get people together, in fact, quite the opposite. I think that um, many of our leaders, and I'm not saying name names right now, have thrived and remained in power because of these divisions. And that it um, unfortunately benefits the system that's in place. And so one of the challenges that we face is overcoming this and getting our kids together so that they share snack and um, pee next to each other in the sandbox. Because it's really hard to hate somebody when you grow up with them and when you, you know them from a, very, very early age. And when there's an interdependency fostered in that relationship, it's really hard to treat yeah. as less than human when you grow up together side by side. And, but the question is how do we do that? Because the programs that exist are generally very self-selected. And so the kids who actually really need it aren't act being exposed to it because there's a, there are a lot of blockades in place, literally, and metaphorically, as it were. And uh, it is an interesting phenomenon that the that Jewish Israelis have start out more right wing and then become more left wing, or, or maybe they become more left wing. It's the older generation that's more left wing. But something that I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out is um, the younger generation remembers the second intifada and there's deep scars from that and, and, and deep fear. And they at least it's the same generation that doesn't know a leader other than Prime Minister Netanyahu. 
And it's hard to imagine something different. And so there's a, there are a lot of factors that come into play here. And, um, and it's a tragedy that we don't meet each other until the university or worse in the army when we meet each other in a way that's not, not conducive to actually becoming friends where there's that right. power of balance and, that, and that threat of violence. Right. So I'd love to figure out a way to actually get beyond that and, and get us together at an earlier age, but getting that done on an institutional level is phenomenally difficult. I'll, I'll take it even a step more and say, eventually, even when you finish college, you still, you might work in the same place, but because of that kind of division, it, you still kind of, hey, yeah, you might eat hummus together, but you're not really feel comfortable. You might not, you're not going to really share your life. You're not going to go out and really become good friends. And, and I see it. So I own a business, a travel business with a, with a Jewish friend. And when I, when I share that, people look at me like, how? Like, it's so uncommon for, you know, there are a few, but it's so uncommon for us to do even business together. Or when I go out with one of my uh, employees there and we have Israelis and Palestinians who work for us and somebody will introduce me, one of my Israeli Jewish uh, staff will introduce me and say, oh, this is Aziz, he's my boss. And I kid you not, so many times people would look at them and say, his name is Aziz and he's your boss because they're not used to an Arab actually employing Israeli Jews or being the boss. Normally it's vice versa. That it we have to find more ways to break this, um, this paradigm of how this relationship works. And then I, I love to see it among my, my staff and my colleagues, because you know I have my office manager in Israel lives in Tel Aviv in Israeli Jew, and her son grew up knowing me. So one of the first names he ever said was mine, which is not normal. So he goes around calling my name and people like, what the heck is he saying? And then my, the same, my family, no, no, this family, no, this kid, no, you know, so it created a bit having this relationship of working together, truly working together, not just like who's above who and working in the traditional side, but having people work day and day together, becoming truly friends. And even in those hard times, I mean, I'm amazed we able to to survive it because we have Israeli guides, Palestinian guides and discussion groups and what's up. I'm like, oh, this is going to go bad. But it's incredible because people have built that relationship, close relationship. They disagree. They argue sometimes, but they're still ready to, to meet and hug and, and work together. So, so let's talk about that disagreement piece for a little bit, because you guys are friends and, and friendly with each other. And um, but but there are certainly positions that uh, you know are have fundamental disagreements, I would imagine, either between you or certainly between Israelis and Palestinians. Are we just ignoring those? I mean, the, the Israelis and Palestinians see the, the land differently to each other. What, what, do we, what do we do with those fundamental disagreements that, that at least on the, the extremes on either side, seem to be the, the the foundation or the impetus for the political conflict and you talk about this political intractability there's there's no incentive to do what you guys are doing in society and then even if there is the incentive to do it or the desire to do it what about still these fundamental things and we haven't even talked about the west bank or gaza right now we're just talking about you know within the 67 borders and israeli uh citizens i don't know if there's a question in that or not but i think there were a couple no, no, I think that's an important, how do we deal with disagreement? Um, well, one, I'll tell you how I deal with it. I don't try to quickly figure out where I'm wrong and where, where we have that disagreement. I try to hear stories before I go into positions and facts and what's happening. I feel when you hear somebody's stories, you connect with what they went through and it makes you more open to understanding their perspective. Yeah, we're not gonna agree on everything, but I think we can sympathize, understand each other much better if we're willing to hear the story, what that person have gone through. And so both Sarah and I are storytellers and that makes it a bit easier because 
if you follow her, if you follow me, you see a lot of our work centers and telling stories of people and trying to get that political differences through those stories. And when you do that, it makes it easier. Um, I, I believe it's important to hear what you disagree with and talk it through, but being open to being wrong, um, bringing some facts on. I, I, one of my favorite things about that WhatsApp group I told you with my guides, with the Sheikh Jarrah thing, each guide was bringing their view of what historically the site was. Does it have a Jewish grave or not? And they, they're looking at historical things and, and they'll bring some facts and uh, everyone is countering the other facts because there is really no one fact in, in some ways in a lot of these issues. And, and it's fascinating for me to hear because each one's going back and forth and eventually, you know, there's not 100% agreement, but there's an understanding that ends up being formed. The problem becomes more when, when there's an issue, I think it's much harder when there's issues that affect us directly and you don't feel that the person on the other side is sympathizing, understanding. So if I'm, if I'm saying, look, I don't have citizenship in Israel or Palestine because I was born in Jerusalem. And it's harder for me when somebody goes, oh, I don't care. That's, uh, you know, well, it's not our problem. Why should you have citizenship? Then it's harder to have that discussion. But in most cases, people are curious. And I find that the issue isn't as much a disagreement. The issue often is the ignorance. Is that it, I tell that to so many Israelis, and I tell you 95% of them are shocked that Palestinians in Jerusalem don't have citizenship. And then they go, but you can, you can just go and get it. And like, well, it's a lot more complicated than just go and get it. Sarah knows about this uh, as well. So if we can get over that ignorance by sharing stories, usually it gets a lot easier to deal with it. I completely agree. With you. And this goes back to that fundamental issue about getting kids together at an early age. Because if you're friends with somebody, if you actually care about them, you're more willing to listen to the harder stuff. And I remember the first time that um, I was walking through the old city and uh, when it, this was after being afraid of the old city for a long time and overcoming that fear and, and deciding to get to know it better. And there was a guy who runs one of the Kanafa restaurants over in the, um, in the Muslim quarter and he asked me to come in and talk to him. He said, you're here all the time, what's your deal? Are you, are you bored? Are you a spy? What, come talk to me. And I felt, I felt scared. It was the first time that I'd be sitting in front of someone Palestinian Muslim, and I wasn't afraid he was going to hurt me. I was, but I was afraid that he was going to upset me, or that I would upset him. That we would get so embroiled in our political differences and our religious differences, and in the way that we see the land, that we wouldn't be able to be in the same space. But I sat down across from him, and we didn't talk about any of that. We talked about his wife's rosemary garden and about how his kid plays soccer. And I talked about how my son plays guitar and my daughter likes to draw. And we talked about the things that make us who we are. And that conversation certainly didn't change the world, but it led to a second, a third and a fourth conversation. It became the basis for a friendship. And then we've been able to talk about the more difficult things and the, the way that we are different, the way that we're similar and the challenges we need to overcome to we're treated by society, by our communities as equals and, um, and, and as friends. So that's really, I think, the personal relationships. Also knowing when to speak and also knowing when to shut up. And for me, that, that's taken some practice. I, yeah. It's a learning but No, it's, it's, sorry. Aziz right about the personal stories really being foundational for creating within the other person that that shifts in in willingness to understand through a different lens i was gonna say i just had lunch today with a friend an israeli friend who lives in the states and in the last three weeks we we argued with each other somehow whenever i posted something or he posted something we went at each other and partially because we're good friends whenever somebody you really good friend with says something that you like i can't believe he's my friend and he said this so we met today over lunch and worked it out. We went through some of our disagreements and talked about it. And it, it ended up being amazing. We both were able to listen to each other. I think often 
I try not to post too much online. I've been doing it more recently because I feel often we get so radicalized through some uh, Twitter or some Facebook because it's, you know, you can't really show any complexity. You can't show really any, um, you can't have a real discussion on Twitter. You can't have a real discussion on, I know, I feel like on Facebook, even you can write more. And you can't show the emotions. There's, it's whatever you write, it's emotionless often, regardless of how much you try. You don't see the face. If you upset somebody, you don't see them crying. You don't see when they are hurt. And so you don't care as much. You don't see the effect of your words on other people. And, and that, on, on online stuff, I feel that's, we often use buzzwords and we start using talking points instead of really connecting. And talking points don't, don't help. We all have, you know, our governments or our whatever people who specialize in public relations have given us those talking points. And instead of seeing the human, you see these talking points. I, I love what you just said, Aziz. And, and it, something just came to my mind. We're spending so much time trying to convince the other that we're right instead of figuring out ways to connect with one another. And, yeah. And, when we're able to do that, we'll be able to move forward in a healthier way. You know, I, I once wrote, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. We, we, Sarah and I can just keep talking for him. It's We've great, done that mind. many times. Yeah, we, no. Rabbi, go you ahead, know, that there were things we would disagree on. We, I think we fundamentally see things pretty similarly. There may be some differences. Well, so I'm right. curious, Aziz, because this, uh, the lunch you had with your uh, Jewish-Israeli friend, so can you give us a glimpse of what it was that you disagreed with and how you worked that out? And then I do have some buzzwords I want to run by you and, and, and see your, let's see, I'd like to, I'd like to hear how you process them, but let, I'd like to, to know a little bit more about that, that conversation. Wow, there were three, four things we disagreed on. So I made a post saying in the beginning of what was going on in Gaza, I was saying I was feeling that a lot of American youths were not talking about the humans in Palestine and seeing us only as numbers and as Hamas, all of us. It's like, well, 20 people died. They wouldn't even write killed, died. And so I, coming from doing some work in journals, I'm like, well, that's that's problematic. You don't write those words. And so he's a journalist, so he didn't agree. And so we went back and forth a few times. So that was one. Another one, uh, an Israeli uh, journalist, uh, comedian, did a, a response to John Oliver. And I thought that response was awful. He thought it was great. So we had to sit and talk about, you know, John Oliver, Bill Maher, uh, Trevor Noah, and how they saw these outsiders, how they report on it. Uh, and how we each kind of gravitate to the one who might be more uh, supportive of our side, if we want to see it that way. So we had a discussion about that. Uh, there was a third one that I suddenly don't remember, a third or fourth one. But it was about, yeah, it was about, oh, I made a post about, uh, about the Israeli police in Jerusalem. And it, it was interesting because he, when we sat today, I was explaining to him those stories. And on Facebook, you, like I said, you can't really explain what was what's going on. And so when we sat today, I was explaining to him what's happening. He was much more willing to listen to that. I was more willing to listen to his journalism experience and his thoughts about why journalists write the way they write. So it was really, it was helpful, I think, for both of us and a learning experience for both of us. You know, I think, Sarah, what you said earlier is so important, and Aziz, you just referenced it, which is being able to see the other person's face, seeing what you say, make what makes them cry as you're talking, and, and, and if there's a humanity to you not wanting to make somebody cry, it becomes that, that meter that gets lost in social media, you know, the, 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 the derech eretz, the, the, the appropriate way yeah. to deal with a person that we throw out in social media, and it has, I think, further inflamed and, and, and concretize so many positions. And so I well, want to, I, go ahead. I found that a few years back, uh, many years back, 20 years back, I decided to go to visit Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. And at that time, I honestly didn't know any Palestinian who've ever been there. Um, to be frank, most Palestinians don't think about the Holocaust, don't want to, because it feels you can't sympathize with the, with the enemy. And so I felt 
if I'm going to engage in talking to Israelis, I need to understand the history, the trauma, where they come from. And I went, I went through and I wrote an article eventually to Haaretz about my experience. And it was very interesting because what I decided to do for once, you know, and for years I'm, I'm trying to explain the Palestinian narrative, where we come from, why Israelis need to listen to us. And honestly, there were many times I failed in getting people to listen. And so I wrote this article and I decided this time I'm not going to write about the occupation. I'm not going to write about what Israelis do to Palestinians. I'm not going to write about any of that. I'm only going to write from the perspective of me going, learning about the Holocaust Museum, what happened in the Holocaust, and just writing about my feelings through all of that without without shifting it to how it affects me as a Palestinian in the sense, what does Israel do to me? Not doing any of that, just sympathizing, understanding, and that's it. And that article, it's very rare to write anything in Israel not get like horribly attacked by everybody. And that article actually didn't get attacked. Not only that, I was getting like dozens of emails from Israelis telling me, thank you for writing this article. We were moved that you were willing to take the time and really understand and sympathize and, and connect with our history. What do you recommend we do to understand yours? And to me, that was interesting. I'm spending so much time trying to convince people to understand my story, but people were more willing to listen when I shut up and I said, I want to listen to your story. So it's something to think about often instead of always pushing our own, is to try to sometimes just take a step back and, and listen, and listen to something that might be hard for us to listen to. Israelis and Palestinians, our histories are really different and painful for us to be willing to listen to something that we think, well, it's not exactly, that's not how it happened, but to take a moment and just listen and sympathize and try to understand and not fight it right away. It, it's, it's difficult, but it's where we, where we should go. So I, I'm curious to know what you would recommend that we could, as, as with your experience of Yad Vashem, that we could do to understand um, the Palestinian narrative and story. But I also want to get to these, these four questions too. So um, can you answer that quickly? And then I want to get to these, these uh, other questions I'm sitting here. Oh, gee, there are tons of things I can suggest. Well, one of my really uh, favorite books uh, was written by a uh, Palestinian author named Sari Nuseba. It's called Once Upon a Country. And it just tells his family story in Jerusalem. It's very easy to uh, read uh, a memoir. If you want to go more political, and it would be harder probably for, for some people to read it, it would be Rashid Khalidi, uh, I think it's called The Hundred Year War on Palestine. That would be much more political, much more uh, uh, strong Palestinian narrative. Um, I like that book called Side by Side, by the way, by uh, Ayal Nave and Sami Adwan, because it gives you both, both narratives right next to each other. You read one page, the Israeli narrative, the other page, the Palestinian narrative. I always recommend it to all my travelers uh, to read uh, just so they they understand it. That's, if you want to go- the, That's the history book, yeah. right? That's the history book? Yeah, it's a history we use book. That, we use that here in our school. Our, oh, our that's school. wonderful. I teach but you that. know, both Israeli and Palestinian schools banned it. I know, and nobody it's hard to get it published. It's hard, it's hard to publish. Thank you. So I want to go to these questions, and then Sarah, I want to start with you. So we talked about trigger words, or that I, there are there are words that trigger, and phrases that trigger. I'm going to list the four that I wrote down, and I'd like to hear your your reactions to them and and how they sit with you and 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 whatnot. So, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Apartheid state, colonialists, and war crimes. Ooh, we could be here a long time on that. I'm gonna, I will, I'm gonna address two of them with your permission. I think the one that surprisingly, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. It, it, it doesn't. That does not set me off. That, do, that doesn't trigger me anymore. I think it used to, I th but it, I, I don't feel that way now. I mean, obviously I've, I've chosen to live in Israel. I've um, wrapped my arms around it. I, I'm a patriot. I hug and wrestle with the complexities of the place. I'm raising two Jewish Israeli kids who um, plan on making their life there. And 
and I love my country. I love my country and obviously I don't want it wiped off the face of the map, but I'm not afraid of that because I have trust in our strength. We're the strongest military power in the Middle East. We're certainly um, one of the strongest in the world. I understand that the history that informs all of that informs that, that sense of um, fear and anxiety when you hear something like that is, is very deep. And, and, I've, and I have felt it, especially with anti-Semitism on the rise, but I've also there on the ground and I know that's not gonna happen. We're not going to be wiped off. I also know what Jewish Israelis say, which we talk about greater Israel from the, really from the river to the sea. When you look at the, the maps in my kids' school, the, the West Bank isn't marked off as something different. Neither is Gaza for that matter. It's one state. It looks like one state. And so I know that we are doing the same thing. We're doing it in a, in a different way, not up on placards, but we're doing it in, in some ways in a, in a much more terrifying way for Palestinians it's in the institutions of the country, where we talk about annexation, where there is creeping annexation without actually addressing it. And so that's something that bothers me when I see that happen, that, uh, that we, that many Jewish Israelis get up in arms when we hear Palestinians protest, Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. And yet we're, what are we doing that's so different when our maps have obliterated Palestine from that map, from the map and, and don't even show the green line anymore where that division doesn't exist. So when I hear that, I just think about ways that we can all figure out a way in, to be equal, to be living in, in justice and to, and big one, to be living safely together in some kind of better future. And I don't know what the solution is, whether it's, it's two states or confederation, or I, I don't, I'm not gonna give you, um, I'm not gonna give you an answer on that because I, I don't have it, but I know day by day, I'm trying to figure that out through getting to know people. And, and I have faith at some point we'll figure out a way forward, hopefully in my lifetime, but. Probably not, but we have to keep trying. We have to keep moving forward as though that is a, a, a joyful inevitability, that, but we have to build it. Now, the word that sets me off, the word that like, like I, I'm grinding my teeth thinking about this word is being called a colonialist or colonial um, settler or an, someone who doesn't belong. Pardon? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. Um, because Israel has been in our dreams, in in our um, in our in our uh, in our hopes for thousands of years. We gather around the seder table every year, and we say next year in Jerusalem. And yes, it may be an abstraction, but it's also a, a real place, and we yearn for it. And our roots go deep in that land. Now, that does not mean that Palestinian roots don't go deep in the land too. And one does not negate the other. And this is the same kind of thing I think about when we have the whole conversation about discussing the Nakba, the catastrophe where um, Palestinians were forced out of their homes and, uh, and became refugees, became dispersed and yearned to go home and carry their, their keys around their necks in some cases. Acknowledging that does not mean that we can't also acknowledge the independence of Israel and, and what a wonderful thing that is, that you can do both. And that's something that I'm trying to teach my kids, that we can celebrate the fact that we have a country, a place where we are safe, a place that, we're, that we can work with and also mourn a tragedy that, that, we, that we did to another people. And by in so doing, then we can say, all right, now how do we make it right? And then we can work together to figure out a solution so that there is that there is a balance and that there is, um, I don't know, peace is the right word, but at least um, justice and security for everyone. But, um, but yeah, that word being called a colonizer, it really gets under my skin because no, we're not. And we are just as much a part of the land as Palestinians are. And the other word that gets under my skin too is when people refer to Palestinians as, um, you know, uh, invaders or usurpers and say that they don't belong. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's the same anger uh, 
I feel that same anger because it, first of all, d d um, here we are, doesn't matter, doesn't matter whether what the history um, entailed, we are all, we're here now, but even on that rational level, the deeper, more visceral reality for me and my feelings is no, Israel is part of my identity. It's part of my DNA. And it's been that way, you know, just despite my, my hair bleach and my, the, the color of my skin, I'm from, I'm, I feel like I am part of that land. And that's a, a deep visceral gut reaction. So there you, there you have it. Thanks, Sarah. Aziz? Uh, my answer is probably shorter in the sense I, I teach a lot um, all over the world, communication and conflict resolution. And I usually tell people, don't use buzzwords, try to explain what you mean. What's, what's really the story behind what you're saying? Because the moment, you know, I'm on a tour, I, I lead tours a lot sometimes for, for my company. And I'm on a tour and people quickly want to box me. And the way they want to box me is they'll ask me, do you use this word? Do you use that word? Do you use this word? What's your view on two state? What's your view on this? And I refuse to answer most of those questions right away because they want to know before I even open my mouth, where do I stand and everything they think about? So they say, in their mind, they can say, okay, we put him on this side and then we don't need to listen to anything else he says because we know he's pro this or pro that. And I refuse to answer them and I don't use these buzzwords because I feel you lose, you can't communicate using these buzzwords. They're good maybe for your propaganda work, PR work, if you're trying to go big on whatever message you're trying to do. But if you're trying to do uh, relationship building and shared society, I, even when any of these words are true, I often think about how do people hear it and how they interpret it and where does it work to really improve communication versus not improve communication. So I've never used, I think I'm almost never used the word apartheid. Do I feel there is a sense of apartheid in, in Jerusalem? Absolutely, to be frank with you, I do. But I don't use it because I don't feel it really communicates what I go through. And I prefer to tell what I go through rather than use a buzzword to tell the story. Lost your camera for a second. Um, Thank you, Aziz. Uh, Sarah, did you, did you, were you trying to say something I couldn't catch? No, okay. So I hear you and I, and I, I appreciate that. And I think, I think that that's such an important point. And we are always, I think, very uh, imprecise in our language when we use this terminology. And then we're, we're always trying to look to see if, what is, how does this fit what I already know? And I think what you've shown us today is, is that while there are parts of this that have echoes that rhyme, with parts of the American Civil Rights Movement, with the Black Lives Matter movement and, and racial injustice in the United States and you know what we understand of apartheid and, and all these things, it's also not exactly the same. And it doesn't fit neatly into this pigeonhole or that box. It's its own thing. Um, so that's, that's just one that's an editorial comment, I guess. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so left in our, in our talk. Um, I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions that have come through. And we've talked about a lot of them. One that, that comes up though a couple of times is about constitutions. The lack of a constitution in Israel uh, and does this uh, complicate discussions uh, and a resolution of disagreements? And I'm gonna add to that the, the, the mission statement, if you would, of Hamas and, uh, and, and where that factors in because Israel does have on its you know, Southern you know, border, a, a, you know, an organization that is, you know, sworn to uh, wipe them off the face of the earth. Um, and so trying to create, you know, commonality and, 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 and peace in that regard seems to be almost a non-starter. Um, comments on that? Again, I'm not sure I formed a question there. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Sarah, you wanna start on the constitution and I'll probably take on Hamas. I think Aziz may be better qualified to answer these questions right now than, than I. All right, I'll, I'll start then with the constitution. I, I don't know how much it affects or not. It's definitely helpful to have a constitution, but a constitution can also be amended and changed as we know in the US and even the US or laws against slavery, pretty much our laws about equal rights and human beings and then 
the Supreme Court in the U.S. said, oh, yeah, but that doesn't apply to black people. <laughs> so you can have a constitution and still uh, and still have serious problems, at least from U.S. history. We know that's true. Uh, I would say um, inclusion is extremely important. I think one of the, the ad Benjamin Netanyahu came up with yesterday shows a lot the problem we fighting uh, against. He had a, a tab and one tab said, I don't know if you saw it, Sarah, and the one tab said Bennett and the other tab says Likud. And then he says, Bennett is willing to give Arab villages in Israel more budget. We are not. Bennett is willing to recognize Arab villages in the Negev. We are not. Ne uh, Bennett is willing, or we are willing to do three, he's willing to do 14. Bennett is willing to, what was the other one? There were like one or two more. And it was crazy because I'm reading that. I'm like, you know, these are citizens that you are saying, I don't want to give them any rights. And the truth is, I know everyone is celebrating in Israel the potential government and that Mansour Abbas, an Arab Muslim party, will be part of the government. But I, re I remind my friends saying he's not really part of the government. He's supporting the government, meaning he's going to be the only part of putting this government together that will not get any ministerial jobs. He will not be getting, you know, the education uh, uh, or the tourism or whatever you want to call it. So there is still a lot to move forward for. And that's important because in my, in my work and studying conflict resolution and uh, radicalism, extremism, lack of inclusion, not poverty, not there's so many things that, yeah, a little bit contributes, but lack of inclusion is the biggest drive of radicalism, extremism, and terrorism in the world. Lack of inclusion. And when people think, oh, well, if we don't include them, we, that we are safer, actually what happens, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People feel not included. Eventually they say, okay, if we're not included, we will act according to it. And then you have another intifada. And that's like, that's what we end up having here is every one or two generations, we end up having a major, major conflict where we don't create a society that feels as a society, um, where you have discrimination, where you have different rules depending on, on, on your ethnicity. Uh, so that's the, the thing regarding the constitution that I can think of. Uh, as for Gaza, you are right. Uh, Hamas has on its books that it will it wants to destroy Israel. Um, I would though recommend reading uh, some of the writings for a guy named Gershon Baskin, who's a very dear friend. And Gershon has actually negotiated with Hamas directly, and would argue that Hamas is actually quite pragmatic. Yes, on books they will not right now say that they would um, make peace with Israel. And his argument for that, I just talked to him a couple of weeks ago, and he always tries to connect the Israeli government with Hamas. He negotiated the release of Gilad Shalit. So he's got really good, good connections there as an Israeli guy, Israeli Jewish guy in Jerusalem. And he was telling me the problem with, that Hamas has is they look at Abu Mazen, at the Palestinian Authority, and they say, you gave up fighting Israel. You actually coordinate security for Israel. You arrest people on behalf of Israel. Two weeks ago, Palestinian police were down in the streets, beating up people, preventing them from reaching checkpoints so there would be no escalation in the West Bank. And they say, so you've done all of that. You've done everything Israel asked you to do. What did you get in return? Nothing. So we would not give up fighting. We will not change any of our... Uh, any of our declarations until we see a good return out of it. Otherwise, we lose the streets. Right now, Hamas is the most popular because people are angry and they feel Hamas at least fighting. Uh, so they, they don't want to, to lose that popularity. And the Palestinian Authority, which has gone toward peace and has, has re, uh, re, Fatah has actually changed its, uh, its bylaws to, to recognize Israel, the PLO has, and they said, but you didn't get anything as a return of it. You got, you know, a couple of cities. You're not really, you're not really able to bring anything. And that to me is scary because the message that is coming also to Palestinians is with violence, you can achieve much more than without violence. And to me, that's terrifying. One, I don't believe it's true, but that's that's how a lot of people are seeing it. And, and that's scary. And I don't think Israelis really realize that that's the message, at least Israeli public realize that that's a message being sent. But on a practical level, 
from the Israelis I know who have, and I know few who have negotiated with, with Hamas, I actually hear there's a lot of potentials. I, I can't tell if, how true that is, but at least that's that's the news I get from them. Sarah, I, I want to ask you, um, and you can both respond to it, but Sarah, coming from the United States and making Aliyah, as we've talked today, it seems so clear to me that these are largely internal domestic issues of a, of a country dealing with its own, you know, justice and lack of justice system and, and inequalities. I'm not going to say like every other country, but every other country has inequalities. We do in Canada here too. And, and these are internal, you know, big problems. And there's a lot of criticism of Israel from outside from within the Jewish community, from outside the Jewish community. Is that helpful? Is that right? Should, and, then, and the second question, which is, both of these can be for both of you, is what should we do from our perspective here to help further, I think, I, I know my congregation and I can't see any of them on here, but I think that, that the relationship that the two of you have and the hopefulness that you present is exactly what we all want to see, uh, or most of us want to see, uh, in Israel going forward, what sh what can we do to help make this more the reality? Then, because um, you've also also said this isn't this is still an exception. This is not the vast majority of relationships between Jews and Palestinians. Criticism outside, and what should we do? There's a I really appreciate both of these questions. Thank you, Rabbi. There's a woman named uh, Rachel Danziger, Sharans Sharansky Danziger. She's uh, Natan Sharansky's daughter. She's a phenomenal writer. And she just wrote a really remarkable piece in Times of Israel called, I will not be uh, a sacrifice, on, the lamb on a sacrifice on your altar of purity. She was addressing this to people abroad, whether they're, I suppose, whether regardless of religion, but folks who, don't have skin in the game in the uh, in Israel Palestine, and so she wrote this piece about um, speaking with someone who was asking her, "Well, what what about um, Israeli oppression?" And then she described her own thought process, remembering a friend of hers who was killed on her wedding day, was um, murdered in a terror attack over on in, in the German colony in the, in the center of Jerusalem on Emek Rafaim. Now she and her father were sitting together on. Um, this brunch before she was supposed to be married and terrorist walked into a cafe and, and blew it up. And, and she and her father were killed along with many others. And she's describing this and at the end, she, she says um, to the, the, this, the person in the story, thank you, you and your scorn are you know, exactly why we need Israel. And, and the piece was very, very powerfully written. And, um, and I, understand her feelings in that piece because that's that can come up for many people when we feel that folks who aren't here are here I'm in Los Angeles forgive me but I, I'm thinking like a, like I'm in Jerusalem but folks who aren't over in Israel and Palestine get so invested in our conflict on, on either side you know whether they they love Israel whether they despise Israel whether they're they love Palestine, whether they despise Palestine, people who don't have skin in the game get so embroiled and care so much. It, frankly, it, it raises the hackles, my hackles a little bit, because I, first of all, I wonder why. Why are people so obsessed with us, number one? And, and two, it, it bothers me because the rhetoric around it from, from all political camps and the, the obsession with it can make those of us living it on the ground become angrier and more defensive and feel like we have to fight against the buzzwords. I agree with Aziz when he's saying about the buzzwords, how they don't help. And when we see that, instead of trying to find ways to connect, we end up trying to convince and we spend all our time doing that instead of actually moving forward. Now, obviously, I welcome criticism of Israel and I, I welcome um, conversation around Israel, but when it's done in a way that asks questions as opposed to 
preaches in a didactic way to us who are living a very complicated um, conflict that can't be, that's not comparable to other conflicts, even though all countries have conflicts and inequality, ours is still not comparable because it's unique to our situation. It's hard, it doesn't help. So what can you do to help? Here's what you can do to help. You can come visit. You can walk in our streets, you can buy from our markets. When you visit the old city, don't just go to the holy sites, go and, and pay money to the shopkeepers because they've got to make an honest living. Get to know people on, from different communities within the conflict. Go on a Mejdi tours, go on Aziz's a dual narrative tour and uh, listen to what Israeli and Palestinian guides have to say about the same space and about their relationship to that space. Look me up. I'm happy to introduce you to people. I'm happy to hang out in the Shuk with you, have coffee, have beer, but when you have whiskey, just putting that out there. But when you get to know people on that personal level and you connect with the place and you, and you feel that, that sense of the enormity of the complexity and the beauty and, and the, the desperation and the hope too, on top of it, and the, and the, the thread of optimism that runs through it, then you're, you're, already, you're already helping. You're helping to be part of a solution that we desperately need. I, I might see it a little bit differently. I agree with you and people coming. I think that's very important. And the only reason I might see it a bit differently, I'm engaged with a few conflicts around the world and maybe because of what I do for, for a living. So I feel very strongly, for example, about what's happening in Syria. And I feel angry that people are not. And they look at what's happening there and not doing anything. I've been there, worked there. I've seen people get killed and people get hurt and drives me crazy when, when it's kind of forgotten conflict. And so I feel as, as a community, as a world, we should care about injustices everywhere, as Martin Luther King Jr. said. Injustice, uh, the lack of ah, uh, suddenly the 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 quote escapes me, but uh, injustice, injustice anywhere somewhere is just, just is injustice, injustice everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Injustice somewhere is injustice everywhere. Um, so I feel that's very true, and I think for me, when I think of Jewish community in the U.S., it is the most community that can influence Israel because you have relationships. You you many of you probably have been there, and so I think you do have. I say now there is, I think saying and criticism and all of that doesn't really make as much. I think doing makes more. And so what Sarah said in that sense, come meet the people, hear their stories and then share their stories. Don't just share the bus stories that you'll hear online. No, go and meet the people and hear their stories. Sit with a Palestinian family, sit with an Israeli family, know what people are going through, go visit the West Bank. Don't just hear about the West Bank, go and visit it. Uh, go to the road, overlook Gaza, understand what's really happening, because it will help you uh, find ways to engage. I, I remember bringing an interfaith group from Michigan a few years back. And until now, that, that group buys products and sells it in Michigan from there. They found a few farmers. They got connected with on the trip. I, don't, I didn't even create that connection. They, we created meetings and took them to places, and they just made friends with these farmers. And they still today, uh, many years later, still are selling those products to help that community. And so they found ways to be supportive. Uh, I think look up, uh, look up uh, anything joint, not just in travel and try to support those things. Uh, actually, the guy who started Hand in Hand is not far from you. He's in Portland, Oregon, if my memory is right. Uh, so supporting these kind of groups, these kind of organizations, push yourself to, to read and educate yourself, especially on what you don't know and from people who don't make you feel comfortable. I often say, if you want to read about the place, don't read that from somebody who looks and looks like you and believes in what you believe. So if I'm reading about Colombia, I don't, I don't pick a white guy to read what he thinks about Colombia. I pick a Colombian guy. If you want to read about Palestine, pick a Palestinian. If you want to read about the religious community in Israel, pick somebody who's religious to read. Don't read it from someone who looks like you. Uh, so that those things, I think, really make a difference. Try to build relationships with, I think you mentioned you're already doing that, with, with us, with a mosque close by your area, with Palestinian community there. Uh, my dad came to the U.S. first time three years ago, I think, something like that. And it was his first time ever in a synagogue, which is crazy. He went 
to fry the mosque and the synagogue was renting their facility to the Muslim community and they held the prayer in the in the synagogue. And he was so moved by it because he never had that opportunity. So even if you're not there, you have no idea how much influence you can have, even on people of us back there when they come, when we come to visit. So that's that's what what comes to my mind. But try to always think constructively and not just think. I actually believe blame alone, you know, tweeting, well, this is right and this is wrong, doesn't absolve you of, oh, I've done my part. And often when people think of activism nowadays, I feel they think if I sat on Twitter for five minutes and I wrote who I hate, then that I've done my part of activism. And on that part, I think it's ridiculous. Sarah, did you want to add something? Go ahead. Yes, actually, I want to click. I think I, I, I don't know if clarify is the right word, but I, I do want, want to say I agree with Aziz um, about ways that you can be involved and that help. I just want to clarify what I mean that doesn't help are when people who aren't involved in the conflict and not educated about the conflict start swinging, or swinging along those buzzwords and and have very strong feelings and write their the list of the people that they despise and, and the things that they hate and they actually are not knowledgeable and don't understand the complexities and are also not doing much more than just stirring up the feelings of the Israelis and Palestinians who then um, retreat to their own camps. Try to I, no, I, I agree. I agree. I, I would just add Recently, the former ambassador to the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. said uh, he wants the Israel to stop investing in relationship with Jews in America and to instead invest their relationship with Christian Zionist uh, evangelicals, because Jews are more likely to be critical when Israel does something uh, that's not right, while evangelical Christians are not. And one, I think that's the craziest idiotic thing that ambassador could say, not surprising to me, considering who he was. Um, you can look him up if you don't know, he, he left a couple of years ago. Um, but I do wanna say, don't let that happen. The Christian evangelical community shouldn't be the one speaking for Israel in the United States, shouldn't be the one handling that relationship because of what he just said. They don't mind seeing the whole Middle East go on fire. They, they honestly, there's too many of them who don't care. I think the Jewish community does care a lot more because many of you have family there, have friends there, have relationship, have connection. And so don't let that extremism become the definition of what Israel is in the United States. And so voices of people who say no to that are really important. I cannot thank you both enough. This has been so enlightening. Um, and hopeful, honestly. And I, in a week, and, and we've had news here in Canada of discovery of, of children uh, who had, uh, died in a residential school over a period of time, 250 children. And the conflict in, in Israel is still you know, echoing here and there's still COVID here. Uh, so in a week and weeks that have been so burdensome on our souls, I feel uplifted uh, by the two of you and, the, and, and, you. and also it's a great challenge that's ahead of us for sure. There's no easy answer. So thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us. Pleasure. Thank you all that joined us. Um, continue to watch for more information from our synagogue about continuing these kinds of conversations and dialogues. We did a Hartman uh, I Engage program on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict a few years ago. We're going to return to that in the coming year uh, to dive deeper into these issues. Um, when you go to Israel, you know, we can all go to Israel. Visit Aziz and Sarah. Go ahead, Aziz. If you need any suggestions for good speakers, I'm sure Sarah and I can give you. Actually, a good friend of mine just published a book I would recommend called Third Party Peacemakers in Judaism, Rabbi Daniel Roth, who's very involved in negotiations in all kind of negotiations around. Uh, and I'm sure both of us, if you want to do more of these meetings, can suggest uh, a few amazing people for you. Thank you so much. Enjoy your days and where you are, because I know Sarah, you're visiting family and Aziz, you're speaking. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you. Be well. Thank you, Rabbi. Thanks for doing this. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Good seeing you. Bye, everyone. Bye.